This is me, Dave Roberts, on the wonderful uh, Meridian 107 FM. Um, well, we've got 20 minutes past the hour of uh, 8 o'clock, and I'm really pleased to say, and I always say this every week, I absolutely love it when the guests come in. And it's, it's basically because I do. And um, I guess sitting right opposite me now is Miss uh, Emily Schlum. Have I said that right? Yeah, you have. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, we, I've been trying to practice the read. <laughs> I had to say your name. Um, uh, Emily has written this book. She, she's an author, obviously, and um, she's written many books. And uh, the one that we, that I actually uh, read over the last couple of weeks is a, a book called The Religion of Self-Enlightenment. Now, um, it's got the word religion in it, so uh, don't get turning off because it, it's, it's, it's got a lot more going for it. It's not like, um, it's not like a, I, I don't know, it's, it's, she's not trying to convert you to a particular religion of any kind. Um, Emily, uh, welcome to Meridian for a start. Thank you for having me. Um, what's the book about? The book is about um, a near-death experience which is had by a man uh, in a car accident after living the most boring life ever ever known to humanity. So in, instead of uh, growing up in a family of faith and believing in deep things and knowing where he stands in terms of his beliefs, he grows up believing in nothing. And then uh, the storyline goes that um, he has a, a nasty surprise when he gets to the afterlife. And um, I've read a lot about near-death experiences and spiritual growth and this kind of thing. And um, apparently, when we die, the most common thing that, we, that is spoken to us is, have you learned to love? And the second most common thing is, how have you made the world a better place? So I thought, that needs to be in my book. If, if that's the meaning of life, to love and to make the world a better place, then wouldn't it be fascinating if this guy met... A divine being and was asked these questions and had a freak out essentially so he goes back to earth knowing in inverted commas why he's here it's um i've got to be honest here mm. it's it's for me it, it wasn't an easy read i mean is, is that just me or did you did you feel that you you know you couldn't leave any stone unturned you had to put in i, I said to you earlier on there were a couple of words in there that i had to actually look up what they meant because i just didn't didn't have a clue and i'm i'm not i'm not, you know I'm, I'm i'm not the brightest person in the world but i don't think i'm the daftest either but uh, there definitely were a couple of words in there that sort of flew by me and i think uh whoa what, what do they mean i had to look them up but uh, i mean did you when you wrote, did think... you when you wrote it did you sort of feel um, I've, I've got to make this as deep as possible. Did, or is that just you? Is that your personality coming through? I think I had a very difficult upbringing and it led me to a lot of questions around about the age of 24 um, when I had a serious nervous breakdown. And this book resulted from those realizations, which I felt really passionately about, and I really, really want to spread the word, in inverted commas, about why we're here in terms of listening to our, ourselves, rather than, and also to love and to be happy and be peaceful with one another and those kind of things. And then also at the university, I felt pushed and pulled around by a lot of um, education ideas and this kind of thing. And uh, obviously the capitalist system has a grip on us all. And uh, I went through life believing that if you played the game, then you'd be rewarded with all the things that you wanted. And I found myself in a situation where I got a lot of things I wanted and I was not rewarded at all in terms of my inner happiness, I guess, my, my inner self. And um, that led me to have a nervous breakdown and really want to say to people um, that things need to change. And luckily, the first review was from Liverpool University's magazine, Ellipsis. And um, that was a student there who um, seemed to really understand and um, appreciate my journey and actually said that it was amazing for her to understand that someone else out there thought like her because I think a lot of us have different different takes on things than the status quo let's say and mm. um, um, it was almost like talking to my younger self when I spoke to her and she obviously appreciated that someone had tried to reach through all the layers of, <laughs> of experience and culture and actually bring her something that meant, meant something to her. Did you, did you in a way because um, the the main character in the book, Carrick, um, he has a basically he does die, but he comes yeah. around again. But he has a, he has all these visions. He sees all these things. You know, he, yeah. you know, he's you know he sees angels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, while he's dead, did you did, were you relating that in a sense to your nervous breakdown? Um, in some ways, it was a metaphor for the whole thing yeah. because it's like this abrupt shock, this um, 
this starting again emotion. Um, I was engaged to someone who is a millionaire essentially, and I could have married him and settled down and been financially secure and, <laughs> you know, all the all the things that little girls dream essentially. And after achieving what I thought was, you know, cultural kind of bliss, you know, of this kind of situation where you're young age, you know, you're going around the world, you've got money and this kind of thing. I was at my least happy. I was extremely, extremely suicidal. And um, that led me to my nervous breakdown and my questioning life. <laughs> so so prior to the your nervous breakdown, et cetera, et cetera, did you, did, did, none of this seemed to be apparent in your mind at all? I mean, were you writing at all? Uh, you... Well, that's the whole thing. I mean, I think it was Eminem who said that he's struggling with demons in his head, you know, in Rap God, and, and they're asking him to in the, eliminate some of the women hate and this kind of thing. And he's like, but why? How can I eliminate hate from love? Because they're such intricately connected emotions and this kind of thing. And I think within us, in my experience, if you really get someone to sit down and talk about their inner world, no one has a fluent inner world that's completely tranquil and there's only one narrative going on that I'm happy and this is what I want to do. A lot of people are like, no, I'm going to leave everything and go to Peru or I'm going to, you know, take up chess because I'm really stressed out or in any kind of like duality that they've got going on. So he really struggles with the character in my book. Yeah, he does. Harmonising you, you, yeah, I, I looked at a little video that you put on YouTube, and you said, you said that you, um, it, took, it, it actually took you eight years to write this book. It, I mean, was that because you were going through the breakdown as well? Well, it's difficult to know what to say with this, because uh, I don't want to spend eight years writing a book and, uh, and then kind of belittle it, do you know what I mean? Because it was this huge journey, and I really want to sit down and do it justice, because I, I think it is the kind of book that can really move people because it moved the writer so much to create it. I had the nervous breakdown and then I really began, I'd begun the book beforehand um, after meeting a guy in a pub who only looked alive when he listened to Pink Floyd. <laughs> and um, yeah, he was a very difficult person to know because he was the most boring man on the planet. And the first line of the book is actually, he was the kind of person who has forgotten why he's here. And uh, I really, I knew that that guy didn't know why he was here in general and only really sparked to life when he listened to music. And I think that's why a lot of people continue to listen to some of those great bands, you know, because they give them those emotions of just like, yeah. Well, that, that's music for you. I mean, that's why, I mean, I guess that's why that primarily this is a music show, because that's my thing. It's a brilliant thing to like be able to yeah. explore. And like you say, you have classical music, hip hop, all these everything. Bits. Yeah, well, there's gifts in so many quarters of, of, of the musical world, you know. Yeah. So, so in this book themselves, would, would you say there is parts of you in this book? Oh, yeah. It's kind of a, a reflection of some of the darker parts of my, my soul and, and some of the lighter parts as well. Like, it, it's ultimately not the kind of book that says, you know, you have to believe this or that or the other. It's, it's very much compassion and it's very much that there's a very lost person in there as well. Like, you know, it's, it's a story about redemption and whether or not the guy completely loses the plot at the end of the book in terms of, like, has he broken himself in in trying to reach the light? Do you know what I mean? Like, because a lot of people go on these journeys, whether it's, like, travelling across India or it, it being drug addicts for 10 years looking for something, you know, it's very hard to break through those kind of like barriers that we have as a person and when he gets to the other side you know where he he wanted to be you know what does he find you know is it an oblivion you know it's it's a book that doesn't really want to tell the reader what what's going on there because otherwise you'd have to pretend like you know it all and this kind of thing the ultimate situation is like it's very difficult to know anything you know <laughs> For sure, for real. But life's life's tough, isn't it? Mm. Oh, it really is. It's not Yeah. I think. I mean, I'm, you know, from my own personal point of view, I always think the best way is to um, accept your lot, as it were. And if you're happy with with your, with your lot, in other words, I, I I mean, I always find the most unhappy people are the people who are chasing the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Yeah, I struggle with delusions and delirium. <laughs> you know, it's, uh... you know, you know, you can give them a, you could give them a million pounds and they'll want two. Yeah, um, the happiest times of my life are definitely when I sit down and with nice people actually, like this, you know, just, just sit down, just talk, no judgment, no fear, you know, fear is a huge thing, when you meet a lot of people they're like not very nice to you and they're kind of like trying to have these kind of competitive ideas all the time, it's really difficult to like sit someone down and 
well, it's not difficult. You just have to find the right people where you can actually be comfortable and start talking from your heart, from your soul, and not yeah. feel embarrassed about whatever you felt in the past, I guess. Are, are you are you a religious person at all? Um, I have given my life to God, which sometimes scares people, but uh, defining God is the part, you know, I, I think God is, to, for me, is within everyone and everything. So I wouldn't say I'm particularly, like, traditionally religious i'm so, certain so, the, so the, there's, there's no there's no sort of um faith as it were uh, like like human faith you're you you kind of you have you kind of pushed that to one side you're going straight to you're going route one straight to god as it were well i just kind of laid my life down because um i felt like i'd had too much do you know what i mean and uh I, as, as soon as i did that my life started improving <laughs> and i i've reached really a, a, a crucial point now where I've become something of um, a hero to some people. Some people have got tattoos on their arms and, you know, written songs about me and asked me to marry oh. them and, like, really gone, you know, I don't pay rent. I'm very supported and, and loved in a lot of ways. Uh, some people have obviously, like, you know, taken umbrage to the fact that I do talk about something so deep as religion, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's very much encouraged to not say anything and to sit here and say, you know, there's a famous... Yeah, like, yeah, to sit here and just say nothing, essentially, and just talk about clothes and hair and, you know, smile away and just be happy and all that kind of thing. But we are suffering, you know, as individuals and as a world, you know, as a result of that pressure, you know. And as a result of, there's, there's no one really speaking up about things, you know. And if they do, they get shouted down sometimes. So. Could, you, could you see yourself going into politics later on, perhaps? No, <laughs> because I, I, I can't stand you know i can't stand there in front of people and tell them what to do for example and i can't but you could use your your thoughts of how you approach say you know your your your, your faith in god you could take that towards a political aim couldn't you yeah but you, you you have to come from the same kind of background as them and there seems to be a lot of um i don't i don't know how to explain it it, it feels like they talk about career politicians and they talk about like there's a standard blueprint which Jeremy Corbyn obviously breaks wonderfully and really appeals to people. I mean, as long as Jeremy Corbyn's out there, I feel like, you know, my part is done, you know. I'm a really big fan of his. All right. Um, and I don't know um, if how many people, like, believe the newspapers when they say horrible things about him, but I think on a human level, you can just look at him and understand that whatever he's saying, it's not like he's saying it from a bad place or, or from any kind of, like, dark ambition or anything like that. He, he's a nice guy. Do we, uh, let's get back to the, um, uh, you know, the kind of uh, the religious aspect. Do you believe in, like, the afterlife? I, well, this is a struggle. And as I get older, it becomes more and more a part of my inner world, you know, because why are we here? Because I, I, was, I was going to say, I, I had a lady on the show hmm, perhaps about a year ago uh, who said that she could talk to the dead. Well, this is the fascinating... Uh, and, and she makes... That's her living. That's her entire living. She goes to these... Uh, I can't remember the types of churches they're called, but people who want to communicate with dead relatives. And she sits there and she says, I can see them, etc., etc. Now, I mean, you know, I've got to be honest and just say that I, I think it's a load of nonsense. I really do. Um, I can't I can't get anything out of it whatsoever. She could tell me anything and I would just say, well, you're a good magician, you're a good magician. You know, you're very good at manipulation, etc. Yeah. Um, but um, there are lots of people who, who think, you know, hey, this is the way to go. Well, I've met some fascinating people who insist that, for example, they have communicated with the dead or that they've had near death experiences and this kind of thing. And, and to be honest, I haven't it's not from a personal place that those kind of, I write about near death experiences and you know kind of like experiences with the dead. I haven't really had that many, I'll be honest. Yet it opens up this discussion when you do write about those experiences, you know, to talk about these kind of things with which is so out there. There's such out there topics, you know. Uh -huh. Have you communicated yeah. with the dead? You know, I don't know what that feels like, but some people insist that they have. And obviously, as a body of scientific research now, because of the improved ability to resuscitate people from states of death or near death, yeah. that's happened since the 70s. And um, Raymond Moody was the first person to actually collate all the research and all the near death experiences that people have had into one book. And he coined the te uh, term near death experience which is wonderful.